today on The Bottom Line, Rich Greenfield of BTIG on why he loves Twitter. And the yield curve gets flatter and flatter. Plus, the most euphoric market we've seen in over 20 years. Hello and welcome to The Bottom Line, presented by Fidelity Investments. Henry Blodgett is at the Cannes Advertising Festival this week. I'm Sarah Silverstein, Executive Editor at Business Insider. It's been a crazy week. Amazon announced a deal to purchase Whole Foods for $13.7 billion. If Amazon is trying to get into the grocery game or have a bigger stake in it, this is certainly going to help them get there. Amazon has 70 fulfillment centers in the U.S., and they will certainly be helped out by Whole Foods' 450 locations in the U.S., but they still won't come close to Walmart's a few thousand that they have. We're going to talk to Rich Greenfield about Amazon. He says everybody's scared of Amazon, but not everybody needs to be. But first, before we get to that, also this week, we've seen more curve flattening after the Fed raised rates again last week. If you look back to right before the Fed raised rates in December through today, you'll see a steady decline in the spread between the two-year and the 10-year, which means a flatter yield curve. So if you look at the yield curve in December, and look at it now, the two-year yield has gone up about 20 basis points, while the 10-year yield has come down about 30 basis points. So the difference between the two has come in about 50 basis points overall. That's like half a percent. You're not getting paid that much more to hold money longer with the government as you are to hold it for a short period of time, which is fine as long as you're not worried about inflation, which the market doesn't seem to be. But if you're my dad, and no matter what the yield curve is doing, your big investment question for me is always, how do I know that I'll be able to buy the same number of hamburgers in 20 years that I can buy today? Then Bill Irving from Fidelity Investments, their bond portfolio manager, has a good tip for you. Tips right now are undervalued. They have been underperforming for the last few months, so it's a good time to get in them. Irving also points out that corporate spreads and high yield spreads have come down quite a bit. And the implied volatility on corporate bonds and high yield bonds is very low. So everything's looking really good there, which means it might be a reason to reduce a little bit of exposure in corporate and high yield bonds. Interestingly, we're seeing the exact same thing in the stock market, and that is this week's bottom line. This week's bottom line is market euphoria of the likes that we haven't seen since 1993. So we've been talking a lot about valuations and how overpriced the market is or relative to where it's been in the past. And if you look at the cyclical adjusted PE ratio from Robert Schiller, you'll see that the CAPE ratio right now is over 30 for the first time since about 2001. But as we always say, it's been higher, it can go higher. So I want to look at another metric today, which I first saw from Deutsche Bank's David Bianco, which looks at the relative valuation of the S&P 500, so the PE ratio, but compares it to where the volatility is. Where is the VIX at? What's the implied fear in the market? So if you look at these two things together, you'll see that the market's trading at a really high valuation, but at the same time, there's very little buying of protection in the market on the downside. There's a, lot, there's a lot less fear than we normally see when the market is trading at these levels. So when you combine these two metrics, we haven't seen the PE relative to the VIX trading at above two since 1993. So there seems to be a lot of exuberance, not a lot of fear, not a lot of people are worried, which means that maybe some people should be. And that's the bottom line. I'm here with Richard Greenfield of BTIG, media and tech analyst and futurist. So big news this week with Amazon purchasing Whole Foods. And in one of your recent notes, you said everybody's scared of Amazon. So is that the case and why should some people not be scared of Amazon and who should be? I think every media company is looking at Amazon going, here's a company that they don't need to just make money on a TV show. I mean, you think about a CBS or an ABC and they're buying content or creating content and you know they expect advertisers to come in and to pay for that show and they expect to have more subscribers to one of their cable networks. You think about Amazon, they're not looking at it in that same way. I mean, yes, do they want more prime subscribers when they create content? Sure, 
but they also want you to buy more dresses and more shoes and shop at, um, now they're going to want you to shop at Whole Foods. The ways in which they make money after keeping you in the ecosystem, and whether that's through Amazon Prime, whether that's through Alexa, whether that's Amazon Fresh, they're looking at how do they keep building a bundle. And you know, I think historically the media space thought about a bundle as it was a bunch of channels. Like you called up Comcast, or if you lived in New York City, you called up Time Warner Cable, now Charter, and you subscribed to a bundle of channels. The bundle now at Amazon is free shipping, it is music on demand, and it's tons of video content, and starting next year, it's actually even gonna be the NFL on Thursday nights. So they're creating a bundle, it's just not the bundle that you and I grew up with, but they're creating a bundle where there's lots of stuff that makes it really sticky and hard not to subscribe. But doesn't that make it scarier for media companies because they don't have to make money, they can spend money to create content, but it doesn't matter? Sure, I mean, look, I think every media company, every legacy media company should be very scared when somebody doesn't have to make money the way you make money. They can afford to do things without advertising. I mean, look, I think the biggest news probably this entire year is that Apple went out and hired two senior executives from Sony Television. The guys who made, I mean, literally, Zach and Jamie, these are two executives that did Breaking Bad, that did The Crown. I mean, they worked intimately with Steve Mosco, who used to run Sony Pictures Television. But they've created some of the most iconic shows that you watch. They're now Apple employees building out content at Apple. What does Apple want? You said, you know, Amazon doesn't need to make money on video. Apple wants to sell iPhones. Apple wants to sell computers. And so the whole kind of way in which you're comparing yourself, these are really scary competitors. Going back to your opening on Amazon, these are scary competitors because they don't need to make money on that alone. They have many other ways of making money, and this is just part of the product. It's one of the things that you know companies like Pandora have suffered from for so long is that they've got these really deep-pocketed competitors who don't need to make money on music. Now the video industry is going to start feeling that same type of pain of new companies coming in with deep pockets who don't care if they lose money or don't make money for long periods of time to capture time and attention. Everybody wants you to spend more time in their ecosystem. And I think it's that, it's that war for your time and attention that you're seeing play out right now. And Apple hired these two execs and before you thought that maybe they were going to buy Disney and now you think they're going to build a content within, in-house? I think there was a lot of investor speculation that Apple, you know, there was speculation back when AT&T bought Time Warner that uh, Apple had looked at Time Warner uh, I don't know how far that ever proceeded or not, but I think there's been a lot of speculation that, okay, if, if, if AT&T is putting their stake in the ground and buying Time Warner, Apple clearly wants to do more in video. They're going to go out and they're going to buy a company. Disney, I mean, many other yeah. companies were thrown, but, but I think Disney was the one because of the board relationship. Everyone kind of thought, like, that's the one that could happen. I think what you're seeing is, remember, f four years and four months ago, there was no House of Cards. So original programming on Netflix literally didn't exist. There was Lily Hammer. I mean, that was literally the only original show that Netflix had was Lily Hammer, a show that you probably didn't see. Did, definitely did definitely not. Definitely didn't see. No one saw, or very few people saw. Four years later, there's a new show every single week. I mean, think about it. In the last few weeks, you've had Master of None, you've had House of Cards, you've had Orange is the New Black, and you've had Bloodline. And there's been more beyond that. And 13 Reasons Why was a few weeks before that. Like, it's been an incredible, you know, surge of original production. They didn't go out and buy a studio. They didn't have to go out and buy Lionsgate. They didn't go out and buy, I mean, they just literally built a studio from scratch. Because if you pay real money for talent, um, basically overpay people even to get them to work for you, and you, they can win the same awards and you put the same billboards in Times Square and the same, you know, you get onto the cover of Entertainment Weekly and you work with Business Insider or wherever, and you get all the places you should be for talent. They want to work with you, they don't care whether it's HBO or whether it's ABC or whether it's Netflix. And I think, so you, you fast forward to Apple, I think rather than go out and spend $225 billion to buy Disney and be kind of attached to the legacy cable bundle that's having so much mm -hmm. trouble right now, I mean, you can't go anywhere without people worrying about ESPN's future. Uh, we were in your lobby and there's literally a magazine with ESPN's future, people worrying about that on the cover of Bloomberg. You know, you, so you look, at the, you look at Apple and you go, they're just gonna build it. They have an incredible balance sheet. And I think what Netflix has shown and what Amazon's showing you right now is that if you have enough money and you have time, and I don't mean decades, but you have several mm -hmm. years, that you can build it from scratch. And I think that's exactly what Apple's gonna do is they're gonna build very methodically, but with serious dollars. You know, Planet of the Apps is just step one. 
think of that as lily hammer like it's mm -hmm. early like this is the beginning step one this is not where they're going to end up in four years and i think you're going to see apple come in and spend a lot of money on really high quality content uh, and probably to support Apple Music. You know, you, we talked about bundles a minute ago in terms of what Amazon's trying to do. My guess is, is Apple's trying to do the exact same thing. So you subscribe to Apple Music. There's 27 million mm -hmm. people worldwide. I think they're going to try to add more value to Apple Music. So after episode one, the only way to get Planet of the Apps is inside of Apple Music. I think now you're going to see a, an increased pace of production of things that will make you subscribe. I'm not sure Planet of the Apps is gonna make you subscribe, but if they had a show like Game of Thrones or House of Cards and there was one of those every few weeks, mm -hmm. that might be a reason that if you're not a big music subscriber in and of yourself, that might be enough to get you over the hump to subscribe. So I think Apple's looking at Amazon and trying to replicate that alternative bundle strategy putting so much in there where you feel compelled to subscribe. And speaking of ESPN, I always looked at that as like, that's how they're gonna hold on to the cable package, to the traditional bundle. And it feels like it's becoming a real weak point for Disney. Look, you listen to like an investor conference call, like an earnings call for Disney, and virtually every question is on ESPN. I mean, you, people are actually apologizing, like I have another ESPN question, because it, it's the question that just doesn't go away. And, and the problem is, is that ESPN doesn't own its content. You know, you're going to shoot this video, Business Insider is going to own this content. You actually own it mm -hmm. and control it, can monetize it however you want to. The problem with ESPN is that they're a renter of content. They actually don't. I mean, the, the, the biggest content they own actually themselves is Sports Center, which has really been devalued in a world where, you know, turn on Twitter and you've got sports scores yeah. coming out of your ears. So the content that ESPN has, the, the stuff that's really high profile, they rent. And the problem with renting is all of these people with deep pockets that we were just talking about, what steps, I mean, it's not so crazy to think of an Apple or an Amazon taking over Monday Night Football in 2022. Absolutely not, it makes perfect sense. If you wanna take the highest profile, if you wanna destabilize the whole ecosystem, literally shatter the traditional media ecosystem, the best way to do it would be to get football because football, to your point on ESPN, sports is what's holding the whole linear bundle together. You attack sports and this whole thing shatters and so, I don't think it's crazy at all. And so ESPN has falling subscribers, but remember they've locked in their costs. So they pay the NFL more mm -hmm. every single year. They pay the NBA more every year. They pay all these sports rights, keep escalating. They've got lower viewership because less people are watching linear TV, especially things like SportsCenter. And they've got fewer subscribers because cable subscribers, probably a lot of the people as I look around your office, um, given their demographics, are probably unlikely to be subscribers. You know, I think the you know the younger generation is just not signing up for cable, and even yeah. even older generations are looking at it, going, "What am I paying $120 a year from?" When, you know, I mean, like, what's what's to watch right now on network television? You know, it's the summer. You're probably watching Netflix or Amazon. Like, why are you subscribing to linear television? And I think it's leading to an acceleration of cord cutting that ESPN has no answer for. And. One of the, I talked to Scott Professor Galloway uh, a month ago, and he said that voice control is going to take away the, net, the necessity of brands. Sure. And you feel similar about voice. I'm enamored with voice, totally enamored. Like, I, I, I don't know completely how it plays out. But, but it's I, in everyone's house. Well, it's starting to be. House. I think it's moving very, very fast. I mean, you know, I think it was in Mary Meeker's deck a few weeks ago, which was sent mm. around that um, I think she had 10 million Alexa Echoes and Echo Dots have already been pushed out. And that's not even counting all the fire sticks that also have Alexa technology. Google's coming on very fast. Google yeah. Assistant is being integrated. Google Lens with Assistant's coming soon. So uh, imagine a world where you show up to your television and you say you wanna watch the Mets. Mm -hmm. You're not gonna care whether it tunes to SNY, Fox, Fox Sports One, ESPN, your DVR, like you don't and care. And right now when you search on like Amazon Fire, it says, oh, do you want to watch this on Netflix or whatever? And it's going to stop doing that. But well, I'm just saying, if you say with your voice, say tune to the Cubs game right now, or tune to the Mets game right now, or tune to the Giants game you right now. You don't care where it's coming from. I think you're just not going to care. So I think brand gets buried and the content rises to the top. Like you're going to say Game of Thrones, will you say HBO? Like, are you going to say tune to HBO? Or are you going to say just, I want Game of Thrones right now? And you won't care where it comes from. So I think, Look, there is so much content available that, you know, I don't think most of the, you know, Food Network may have a brand, Nickelodeon may have a brand, but most networks don't have a very strong mm -hmm. brand identity. Like, I don't think you just turn on a lot of channels and just leave them on all day.
Just for just for the children. Just Disney. Yeah, like there's just not a lot of channels that have that type of brand equity. Yeah. So if you're tuning, you're usually going to watch a show. Voice does that really well, faster than you can manipulate those. I mean, think about it. Think about your phone and how. Think about ten years ago, you had probably had a razor. Black, I did. Probably a pink. pink one. See, I knew you had a pink one. I don't so, even like pink, but I did have a pink razor. So 10, cool. 10, 11 years ago, you had a pink razor. Mm -hmm. Now you have an iPhone or an Android phone that looks like a supercomputer in your pocket. You go home at night and you look at that cable remote, and it is the most antiquated piece of hardware in your house. Like it literally hasn't changed in a decade. It's it's embarrassing how bad that technology is. And so search and discovery and navigation is terrible. And you know, I think voice is it, it's ripe for disruption with voice. And to search all of that data with your voice and say, I just want this. I think is going to be incredibly powerful. And you're starting to see, I mean, the first TVs, you know, um, Dish Network just announced that they're actually embedding Alexa. They, so they have a voice remote. And so you'll be able to say to Dish, you know, tune to whatever you want. Pick Modern Family. And it's going to find Modern Family either live or on oh. demand. And you really like Twitter right now. I do. I am the Why only, do you like Twitter I think we're so the much. only person that likes Twitter. I, I think you might be. Twitter is, I think Twitter, the most important thing to think about is that Twitter didn't innovate for eight years. You know, if you really look at the product, it really hadn't changed. You know, when you were using it originally, I don't know if you were that early talk user. a lot about the algorithm, and, and it yeah. was just chronological. But it was also just, it hadn't, the actual, like, what it looked like hadn't changed a lot. The syntax wasn't easy to understand. Like, they made it hard to understand what Twitter was. You would go onto it, and you would see the tweet from a second ago. But most people, like, uh, probably the two of us may care about what happened one second ago. But my mom doesn't care about what happened one second ago. She cares about what's most interesting over mm -hmm. the last four hours since she may have checked it. Now they're delivering, you know, a, a, a algorithmically ranked feed, showing you stuff that you should be interested in, making the syntax easier. Like just like the little, the little, little like mark to show a reply with an arrow. Now it's a speech bubble. Like they're they're using syntax that makes it more understandable. They had a mobile web product that was pretty terrible. Now they have a mobile web product that basically is like a mobile app on the web itself. And is it helping already? You're seeing user growth has grown from basically flatline for three years on it. So daily active users, the metric of you know, what matters the most. Mm -hmm. So how many people are using Twitter every single day? It's relatively flat for three years. It's now growing mid-teens. So things are getting a lot better from a user standpoint. Revenues are still under pressure. That's why the whole, you know, I think that's why Wall Street generally hates it. I've left it for dead. I mean, usually things on the internet, once they start declining, they die. Then, you know, often somebody buys them. Think of AOL and Yahoo. But the reality is it's hard to come back. Moving DAUs, daily active users, up mid-teens after it stagnated for so long is a real accomplishment. Every media company that we were just talking about over this discussion is struggling to find, one, a way to have a direct relationship with consumers, two, data on consumers on who they are, and three, a mobile presence. Twitter solves that for lots of companies uh, in the media space who don't have any mobile strategy and don't know how to talk and directly to consumers. And you think that that's possibly what's going to happen, that, that I, they I'd be might shocked. be acquired? I'd be shocked if Twitter is a public company in two years. And who would be most benefited by having Twitter? Part of them. I think anybody who's in the news, sports, and information. I mean, we were looking at the TV before this started, and you think about all the new, the world politics and news and information. Mm -hmm. the sports. I mean, clearly, sports talk radio plays out on Twitter every single day. I mean, if you're a sports fan, you're yeah. following the beat reporters. You're part of that discussion. So I think it's companies that are highly vested in news and information. So whether that's Disney, maybe it's Comcast with NBC. Maybe that's AT and T, Directv, CNN, the whole complex so that's going to be. Live still matters. Yeah, and it could be Google. I mean, from a data standpoint, it could be companies like Microsoft. I think there's a wide array of potential acquirers. The reality is, first things first. Twitter's got to start growing revenues again, mm -hmm. and proving to people that user growth translates into revenue growth. It's going to take a few quarters, but the story is getting better. Wall Street's avoiding it. That's great. We love we love we love things that have been left for dead that everybody hates and where we think there's actually data points that show things are getting better. Twitter is that. And I, I think people are, you know, P Twitter's becoming more useful. I mean, everything that touches news, I don't know your metrics for Business Insider, but you look at anything that touches news and information right now, talk radio, you look at, you know, podcasts, you look at newspaper sales, online newspaper sales, you look at CNN and MSN. I mean, everything that touches news and information is surging. Twitter 
is the definition of news and information on a mobile device. I think Twitter's in a very good position. You know, Trump certainly doesn't hurt, but I think the, the overall thirst for information on mobile devices is a nice tailwind. It wasn't a tailwind when they had a crappy product, but the product's really gotten better. People are finding it easier to use and they're spending more time once they're there because they're showing you the stuff that you should see. And that's the, I think the fundamentally biggest change is they're actually using data and AI, artificial intelligence, to show you the right tweet at the right time. And you have a price target of 25? We on do. Twitter right now? Twitter's and a our favorite. We love Twitter. It's your favorite. Oh, look, I just think it's the one everyone, I love what people hate. Mm -hmm. And I think there's, there's an opportunity here if it works. It, I think it comes back far faster than people think. It's going to take a few quarters. This is yeah. not a quick turnaround, but I think the story over the next year uh, is really encouraging because so many people are betting against them. And one more, just sure. Snap. How are you feeling about Snap? When you look at the, the innovation, it's been astounding. I mean, I met the company when they were 20 people sitting in a beach house in Venice, California. And if you would have told me that what was essentially, you know, it was considered the time, and if you picked up the Wall Street Journal and read an article on Snapchat then, you know, it was a sexting app. And, I mean, point blank, that's what people mm -hmm. literally thought of it as. And if you think of the brilliance of Evan Spiegel to take what that was to its storytelling, to the point where Facebook is literally copying Snapchat from a feature standpoint and doing Instagram stories. But can Snapchat survive that with I think somebody that's, like Facebook coming look, after them so hard? Look, that's the question. I mean, you look at the... You know, Instagram Stories has now surpassed 250 million users, daily users, um, blown right past Snapchat and just never looked back. I mean, the, the number looks almost vertical in terms of the speed of the, the Instagram Stories growth. The question for Snapchat for investors and the reason we're sitting on the sidelines at neutral and just kind of waiting is that it really comes down to innovation. Can Evan Spiegel and team, Bobby Murphy, the other co-founder, can they out-innovate? in a way that Facebook can't copy them. They have to out-innovate. You know, stories as a format happened, what, three years ago, and it took till now for Facebook to copy them? We don't know what we don't know, you know, in terms of product. They've given no view on, like, the product pipeline for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. You know, if there's amazing product out of Snapchat, there's certainly upside and value creation that could be had. If there isn't awesome value creation, the, they're certainly under siege from Facebook. And there's no doubt that the Instagram, you know, is a real threat. And it's, it's what give, makes us very cautious on what is still a very big valuation. You know, on a relative basis, we'd much rather own Twitter here than Snapchat. Final question, what is your favorite content provider as, well, I know what it is as an investment, so it's Twitter, right? No, Netflix, I mean, I think Netflix and is then a, as a, yeah, as I think a as a, if, if you're talking about content creation, I think Netflix is a great stock to own. I mean, I think Netflix is totally changing the game. I mean, if you were to think about over the last, Let's say the last eight, let's use 18 months as the time frame. Name the TV, sh pieces of TV content that have new pieces of content, not existing, but new content that is truly broken through. I think you'd say This Is Us. I think you'd say OJ on FX. Yes. Right? I mean, those were two, you know, both of those were truly mm -hmm. kind of like groundbreaking shows. You would say um, 13 Reasons Why. And you'd probably say, you know, I don't know, you... In terms of truly iconic, I mean, Making of a Murderer took the world by storm. Maybe you'd say Handmaid's Tale. But the point is, is that so little of this content is on linear television. Yeah. And so Netflix is taking on so much of what I would call the iconic content. I mean, I didn't even mention The Crown, but like, there's so much content. With a big show like every week or two coming out, it's getting harder and harder not to subscribe to Netflix. And, you know, I think when you look at now over 100 million subscribers and they're just getting started. They're starting to really ramp in India. They're starting to really ramp in Japan. I mean, it's early, early days, but there's huge upside in market. I mean, Japan has 45 million broadband subscribers. There's a huge potential of, let's just say they're under a million subscribers in Japan. There's huge runway over the next several years uh, relative to where they are. And so while the U.S. at 50 million plus subscribers, yeah, maybe they'll get to 65 over time, maybe even 70. But the big upside is international now, and it's still really early. And so we, we continue to really like Netflix here. And, you know, we've been, uh, on the thesis has basically been you want to own Netflix, you want to short Disney, you want to own Facebook. And, you know, Twitter gets, I think just Twitter's in a really interesting position where, you know, Twitter just hasn't been focused on enough. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for coming in. Thanks for having me.
Thank you so much for joining us. A big thanks to Fidelity Investments, as always, for making the show possible. Thanks to Rich Greenfield of BTIG for joining us today. Henry Blodgett will be back next week.